Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If this is your first time here or you've been sitting in the back row, if you like what you're hearing, please hit that subscribe button and also set your notification bell to all. That way you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Creepy Encounters. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll play the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. We were on a road to Queensland and back. We were in no hurry, so we were taking the scenic route. At one stage, we pulled up at a truck stop on a highway that ran alongside the forest. It was a very isolated place. We were sitting there trying to get my son some snacks and have a break when a ute pulled up behind us. The guy inside sat there for ages, just staring at us, and I said to my husband, this guy is creeping me out, let's go. So we started to pack up, and he got out of his ute. He was walking towards us as we got into our car. Before we knew it, he was there, and he asked for a cigarette. My husband said he only smokes rollies, and he didn't have one rolled. And the guy said, I'll wait. He never said more than that in the entire encounter. He leaned in and he stared at me with the creepiest, predatory look I have ever seen and this weird ass grin. The whole time he kept one hand behind him. Suddenly he leant right in the car and at that moment my two year old said hi. This guy backed away like his ass was on fire, didn't wait for a cigarette. He just bolted back to his ute and we took off. We always thought he had bad intentions and didn't realize we had a kid in the car. And when he did, that threw him maybe. We both agree that that was the creepiest encounter of our lives and we were pretty sure of his intentions. The really creepy thing is, it wasn't until we were driving that we realized we were in the Belongio State Forest where serial killer Ivan Milot had buried all of his victims. There was always a theory that he didn't work alone and that one of his brothers was involved. Who knows? Oh, and to clear up some confusion, our ute is what Americans call a pickup truck. In 2002, when I was 16, my parents went on vacation while they were gone, I stayed at my older sister's, Lisa's, apartment with her and my eight-year-old niece, Sarah. It was during fall break, so Sarah and I were out of school. Since it was only a two-bedroom apartment, Lisa let me sleep in Sarah's room, and Sarah slept in Lisa's room with her. On this particular morning, Sarah and I both slept in. She was so excited that I was staying with them she wanted to stay up all night watching Disney movies. So, we did. Lisa had fallen asleep on the sofa, so I picked Sarah up and put her in Lisa's bed. Then I went to bed myself. The next morning, I woke up to a man's voice. Lisa's boyfriend, Gary, had a very recognizable, deep voice, kind of like Van Diesel. This voice wasn't Gary's voice at all. This voice was an older man, and he sounded very agitated. I went into the living room to see who was there, and I saw the man sitting on the love seat closest to the front door, and Lisa was sitting in a chair adjacent to the love seat. He looked to be in his 60s, and his shirt and jacket were nearly covered in blood splatter. She shot a fearful, surprised glance at me, as if she forgot I was there. The man stopped talking once he noticed Lisa had looked away from him. I made eye contact with him, and he smiled. Then he placed the gun that he was holding onto the coffee table in front of him. 
I couldn't move. I didn't know what to do. My first thought was to get between him and Lisa somehow, but I knew I had to stay where I was because he would have to get past me to get to the bedroom where Sarah was still sleeping. I searched the man's face trying to figure out who he was. He looked familiar, but I couldn't place him. He broke the silence. Hey, I didn't know anybody else was here. I'm Eddie, Gary's stepdad. I faked a smile and gave him a weak wave. He took out a cigarette and lit it. Lisa was still sitting on the sofa, seemingly bracing herself for whatever Eddie had planned. Eddie motioned for me to sit down on the bigger sofa across from him. I did as he said. He took out a bag of weed and some rolling papers and began to roll a joint. You smoke, youngster? He asked me. Lisa spoke up. No, he doesn't. That's my baby brother. He's only 16. Eddie laughed, looked at Lisa, then me and said, <laughs> Well, damn. What the hell y'all feeding these kids? That's a big one right there. Lisa laughed nervously. Eddie joined her, seemingly unaware of how uncomfortable we were. Oh, shit. I got sidetracked. Let me, <laughs> let me finish telling you what this crazy girl did, Lisa. Eddie went on to tell Lisa that he had just shot and killed a woman he knew because she stole $100 from him the previous night after he had passed out drunk at home. He said he knew it was her because he had pistol whipped Gary's mother and made her tell him who went through his wallet while he slept. He then told Lisa he regretted not killing Gary's mother because he felt like she had set him up somehow. He said she'd also shot the woman's husband, but was unsure if he was dead. He laughed and said he knew for sure the woman was dead because her head exploded like a watermelon. My stomach was in knots. I was sweating, and I could no longer hide my fear. I heard Lisa's bedroom door open from where I sat. I saw Sarah walking across the hallway into the bathroom. Eddie looked in the direction of the hallway. Damn, Lisa, who else was here? Lisa spoke quickly. It's Sarah. Please, Eddie, you know I don't allow smoking around her. Can you please go out on the patio with that? Lisa's voice trembled. Eddie must have heard the fear in her voice because he replied, Girl, what you scared of? I ain't gonna do nothing to you. You good people. I just wanted to come back and see it before I headed out. You know the police is probably looking for me by now. But I just couldn't leave without seeing my favorite spades partner. Eddie smiled as he stood up and gathered his bag of weed, the joint, and gun. I heard the toilet flush, then the sound of water running in the bathroom. I began to pray that Sarah wouldn't come out here before he left. Eddie must have read my thoughts because he said, Don't worry, young blood. I'm going to get on out of here before that baby can see me like this. Lisa and I both stood up as he walked to the door. Lisa opened the door for him, and he walked out. We watched through the window as he got into his car and drove away. Lisa quickly grabbed the phone and dialed 911. Sarah came out of the bathroom and asked if the scary man was gone. Lisa said yes and hugged Sarah. Sarah began to tell me she never liked Eddie because he acted strange and looked extremely scary. When she heard his voice on her way to the bathroom, she stayed in there because she didn't want to come out and see him. I was pacing back and forth, trying to process what had just happened. Lisa explained that Eddie was a drug addict and alcoholic. Gary's mother had kicked him out, but he would keep popping up at her house. She was already aware that Eddie had attacked Gary's mother because Gary had called to tell her though they didn't know he'd killed anyone when he came to Lisa's house. Eddie was arrested shortly after our encounter, and we had to talk to detectives. They told us the man he shot had died on the way to the hospital. It took years for me to forget the way he gleefully described killing that woman. He died in prison not long after he was convicted of those murders.
I'm a South American woman, but I've been living in the States for about 11 years now. I first moved to Colorado when I was 21 to the small mountain town of Silverthorne. I was recruited by an exchange student program for college students in South America to come to the USA, work, and travel during summer break in the South. Up to that point, I had never seen snow in my life, so I was extremely excited to be living in a cold, snowy place for once. I was going to be working at a very popular hotel in the town of Frisco, not too far from the hostel I was living in. The hostel itself had its own creepy stories, but I won't talk about them in details at the moment. That will be for later, perhaps. So far, I didn't know exactly what kind of a job I would be doing in the hotel. All I knew was that I was supposed to show up there on a certain date in time to talk to the owner. An Ukrainian-American guy that was probably in his mid-40s back then. So I show up introduce myself with the basic English I had at the time and tell him I'm excited to start working there. He gives me a weird long stare, almost as if he was analyzing me. He was a tall man with very pronounced eyebrows, so that kind of creeped me out for a second. He then showed me to the restaurant and said I would be working there as a hostess, besides delivering room service orders. I really didn't think my English was that good to be in close contact with the public back then. I thought I would be working back house or housekeeping. But he insisted. For those who are familiar with the area, this part of Colorado is not too far from Bale. So it's needless to say, they got very, very busy during ski season, and I was dealing with customers from all over the world. That's when I also started helping out as a server during breakfast, and of course would get lots of orders wrong by my lack of English, which made the owner very, very upset. I remember one time that my coworker and friend was taking a little bit longer to wipe down one of the tables when we had guests waiting to be seated. So he grabbed the towel from under her hand, yelled at both of us to get out and stop being so damn useless and then proceeded to throw the towel in her face. Let me just make a small note here to say that this girl was also an immigrant like me, with fantastic English and living in the country for years. But he would always try and find ways to show us how slow, dumb, or inferior we were compared to him, an American citizen. Then, at night, after the place had slowed down, he would then act all apologetic and buy us drinks at the bar, make forward comments about my appearance and even caress, uh-huh, my legs. I was starting to feel uncomfortable around him and would always try to not be in the same room as he was. During work hours, I would be focused on customers or talking to my coworkers, and I would never make eye contact with him if he was present. On New Year's Eve that year, there was a big incident in the hostel I lived at. I was out that night with a few co-workers, but learned later that one of the residents had gotten way too high on who knows which drug and started chasing down one of my friends, also from South America, inside the hostel while pointing a gun at him, yelling racist slurs and making death threats. He got arrested but it was easy to say that most of the students living there no longer felt safe. While telling about the incident to one of my coworkers the next day, the big boss overheard the conversation and immediately came to check on me and make sure I was okay. I thought he was being very nice and thanked him for checking. He said I should not be staying at that hostel anymore given the circumstances and invited me to stay in one of the hotel rooms free of charge for the next two weeks while I looked for a new place. That seemed very generous of him, especially given the fact the hotel would be completely booked often since it was the peak of ski season. I accepted his offer and moved in the next day. I was so overwhelmed with happiness for finally having some privacy. I was sharing a room with five other girls in the hostel and for getting some extra sleep before working my breakfast shift since I was now literally living at work. 
That was until one night later that week, where I felt extremely exhausted after being slammed in the restaurant all day and delivering orders to several rooms. I was ready to get cozy in my hotel room and go to sleep. I was off that next day. I think it was around 2 in the morning when I woke up completely groggy. I noticed that my room door was open. I could see the lights in the hallway. Then I noticed the silhouette of a tall person standing inside my room and watching me sleep. I couldn't see a face, but could definitely tell it was a man. As I start realizing what's going on, I hear a metal clinking noise, as if he was getting ready to take his belt off. What the hell? I yelled. That person quickly got out of my bedroom. The next day, I asked management and my co-workers and said there was definitely someone in my room the night before. They said I was probably dreaming or someone from housekeeping must have gotten into the wrong room. Uh, wrong room? At two in the morning? Housekeeping? The owner didn't comment on the case and stopped talking to me or even acknowledging my presence after that. To my relief, of course. Nothing else happened. I moved on, got a new job, a new apartment to live in, etc. About a year after my little incident, while checking the local Summit Daily News, who did I see on the front page? Him, the owner. He had been arrested the night before after getting two female hotel guests way too drunk at the bar and letting himself into their rooms once they had crashed for the night. They woke up, and there he was, standing in the room, staring at them, while getting ready to make his next move. They screamed bloody murder and called the police immediately. Was it him in my room that night? I'm 99% sure it was, but kind of relieved I didn't get to find out. What creeps me out the most about this situation is that, what about those nights I completely crash after one too many drinks? You know how the altitude can affect your alcohol tolerance, and oh man, it really did it for me. I'm from the sea level and not a big drinker, but a few times I woke up with zero memories from the night before. So, the unsettling question is, was that the first time someone got in my room? And how many more guests at this hotel had this happened to them without even realizing it? Back around 1991, I was 20 and newly single for my first love, unemployed and living with two friends. I started hanging out with one of my friends' church friends, kind of like street church people, no denomination. Basic Christian beliefs, nothing crazy at all, anyways. There were about five of them sharing a pretty big apartment and we'd all hang out there and many people would drop by once in a while. Then, this one girl, Bernice, dropped by one day. A very pretty girl, by the way, but around seven to eight years older than I was. And when you're 20, you can seem like a pretty significant age difference, in my opinion. But whatever. Irrelevant, I suppose. Although she was pretty, I just wasn't immediately into her, is my point. Once she first saw me in the apartment, though, she would not stop staring at me the entire time she was there. And she was very obvious about it, and everyone at the apartment could tell she was acting really, really creepy towards me. Everyone was kind of looking at her and noticing that she was very fixated. And then I remember them trying to talk to her, get her out of her trance but she would barely acknowledge anyone else talking to her. There was so much tension in the one to two hours she was there. I was new amongst the group and a shy person in general, so I didn't want to come out and ask what the hell is going on, as I'm sure many other people would have. So I just stayed in my corner and kept watching TV and tried to not look in her direction. Then, once she finally left, I could breathe again. They eventually admitted to me that she had a few 
psychological problems, is the best way I can remember their description. It was a long time ago, so I don't really remember exactly what they said about her, so I'm trying to keep it simple. After this revelation, her weird behavior made a smidge more sense, but it still didn't point to what this all had to do with her fixation towards me that night. Maybe it was because I was the new guy in the group that night, and she was not used to seeing anyone new. Who knows, I thought. Regardless, it was disturbing and made me anxious about seeing her again. So, about a week later, I think, I drop in and everyone there is staring at me when I walk through the door. What's going on? I ask. Bernice was here today. Okay, and... She left a letter that she wrote for you. Here. She had written a two to three page letter to me that she just left on the table for anyone else to see and read if they wanted to. Which is why they were all acting so freaked out when they told me about it. Anyways, they all told me it wasn't good. Basically, from what I recall, she starts out quite rambling about when she first saw me, she thought, I saw Jesus. And she goes on and on about it, saying things like, I'm not 100% sure if you are or, or not, but I think you are, and I love you with all of my heart. Can't stop thinking about you. I just want to be together, etc., etc., etc. I almost shit myself halfway through reading this thing and everyone there is just in suspense as they're watching me read it. Once I was done, and I was probably as pale as a ghost, I seem to remember them telling me to not worry about it too much, and that they would make sure she would not come around anymore, in a nice way, mind you, especially if I was there. Then, being in a relatively small town about a year or more later on, I bump into her at a club. Damn it. It was about two or three days before Christmas, and I said hello to be polite because she came right up to me. My heart was in my throat, and I imagine I probably started sweating profusely in that instant. I remember her talking to me kind of normal for a few minutes. Normal chit-chat about how I was and stuff like that. So I thought, okay, maybe she came to her senses a little. I was hoping and praying I let my guard down a little and started to relax. Within five minutes of that conversation, though, she drops a bomb and invites me for Christmas supper at her mom's house with just her and her mother. This may sound like an innocent and possibly nice thing to do under normal circumstances, but not in these circumstances. This was way, way too much. I gave her a really confused look, but... I was out pretty damn quick after that. Today, I was on my way home. I was about one mile out from my apartment and cruising with my windows down, smoking a cigarette, listening to some Kendrick Lamar. I noticed to my right that a white car had sped up to be next to me but I didn't think too much of it. As I approached where I would usually take a left into my complex, I decided based on their behavior, this wasn't the best idea. At this point, I still had not looked at the driver or looked over to acknowledge them. I continued past my usual and got to the next light, where again, they pulled up next to me. After the light turned green, I started speeding up to a max of around 80 or 85 miles per hour down a residential road with only their car and my own on it. The car was neck to neck with me the entire time, not trying to race, not trying to overtake me or anything, completely matching my speed. I think, mm, okay, this is fun. Because, I mean, going fast with a stranger is a cool experience sometimes. But once again, I became weary when we approached the next light, and I decided to turn left to basically circle back to my house, thinking they had their fun and I had obliged long enough. 
She had been next to me or following me for like the last 10 miles at this point. They immediately switched two lanes over to get behind me. I turned left and sped up once again, and they, once again, matched my exact speed. I still have not looked at the driver at this point. I want to get into the furthest left lane to be able to turn down the street towards my house. But she was directly next to me, so I couldn't get over. We approach the light, and it's a red. I slow to a stop and still don't look over, pulling a drag of my cigarette and looking for a song to pick. I suddenly hear a girl's voice ask, Where did you get your glasses? It is at this moment I decide to look over and see a single driver, a girl, most likely in her mid-twenties or early thirties. The first thing I noticed about her and her wide-eyed stare. If you have ever seen a psychotic break in a person or drug-induced psychosis in a person, you would know what I'm talking about. I went to college for psychology, so that plays a little bit into my decision-making in this as well. I also noticed that her back windows were completely tinted. It was a pretty nice car, so that means she has access to money. And after I made those statements, I responded, over there at Vista Vision, or whatever it was. And she replies, oh, and is still staring at me. She then asks, are you from here? And I say, no, well, I've been here for a while, but I'm from Alaska. The next question she asks is really what put me into suspicious and alert mode. Oh, so you don't have a lot of friends. Actually, she made it as more of a statement, not a question, while still wide-eyed. At this point, I am sort of like, all right. But then she asks, so what do you like to do for fun? And I reply, uh, well, I mean, I go to concerts. But this question weirded me out, too, because it's like, it's been a pandemic. What do I do for fun isn't the same. And then she says, Oh, okay, and just stares at me. Then I wait for her to continue or something, and then I decided to ask, How about you? And she replies, Oh, um, I don't really do anything really. I've never been to a concert. And I reply, Oh, I see. At this point, the light finally turns green, and I think that's the end of it. Suddenly, I hear, You're really sexy. Now, here's the thing. I'm not one to take compliments well, so I awkwardly replied, uh, Well, thank you. And then she asks, Do you want to exchange numbers? While we are driving and she is matching my speed still, I hesitated for a moment. But for the sake of the experience and story, I say sure. She says okay and I pull forward, and she pulls behind me. I drive for about two miles before reaching the point, basically where she had started following me in the first place. I pull into another little neighborhood that has an office and parking area in the front. I purposefully parked in a spot she can pull up next to me and tell me her number on my left side. She then pulls into a spot basically two spots away to the right of me. Weird, I thought to myself. At this time, it's around 5.50 or 6 p.m., and it's pretty dark outside. I roll down my passenger side window, and she rolls down her window, and is staring at me, and goes, What? And I say, I didn't say anything. I then ask, So do you want my number, or do you want to give me yours? She stares at me, thinking. She says, You just take my number. I pull out my phone, and I look at her and say, Okay, go ahead. She stares at me. She says, One second. And reaching around for a maximum of four seconds before she sticks her hand out the window with a piece of paper. Come here, she says, with the first smile she's had the whole time. Uh, why? What's up? I ask. Come here, she says, still smiling waving the paper, 
At this moment, I notice one hand is out the window waving the paper, while the other appears to be reaching into the door compartment below the window. Looking at her, I say, I don't know. Can I trust you? <laughs> I mean, I don't see why not, she says, with this look of total fake shock that would say that. Uh, I don't know. I don't know you at all. Now, this might sound like I'm overthinking things, but based on her facial reactions, or lack thereof, I didn't feel like she was hurt, that I was weirded out, and that's weird. At this moment, I say, uh, I'm sorry, I just watch way too many YouTube videos. Well, because it's true, for the past five months, I've been obsessed with interrogation videos and other criminal investigations. And she then says, okay, just give me your number. I then say, okay, are you ready? She stares at me. Yeah. I then start listing off my number. She stares at me. After I finish, she stares at me. Then I say, and my name is Redacted. She repeats, yes. She then waves the paper again. You don't want it? No, just text me and I'll have your number, I reply. She stares at me. Um, okay. I then say, have a good night, and I go to leave. She starts her car and backs it up and basically pulls up behind me, stopping for no reason. I notice she's looking my direction as I peek at my driver's side rear view mirror. I then start to reverse so she knows that I'm not staying around. She pulls out of the way. I head home. Park, make sure nobody followed me. Head up to my home. I don't know who or what was behind those tenant windows, and I don't know why she wanted me to come over there to get her number in 2020. Sketch. I don't know why she made the statement about me having a lot of friends. I mean, I can speculate, but either way, I think if I made the wrong decision tonight, I could have ended up dead or somewhere I did not want to be. In 2019, I moved to a post-Soviet country for work. There's this American diner I always go on Saturdays for lunch. It's a one-of-a-kind place in the city, owned by this half-Cuban dude who loves the USA. Not surprisingly, the place attracts lots of American expats who want to feel at home. It takes me around 25 minutes to get there, walking from my apartment. But, as it gets extremely cold during winter months, I always take a taxi that drops me off next to a big mall on the opposite side of the narrow street where the diner is. The street is inaccessible by car. It's hard to describe, but the best way to reach the restaurant's entrance is by crossing the fenced garden of an old wooden church. It's an Orthodox church from the 19th century turned into a museum. It is now surrounded by massive office buildings. The garden is small, you can cross it in three minutes, and the exit gate faces the restaurant. During winter, snow covers it completely. It was a Saturday morning, January if I recall correctly, and the snow was fresh on the floor. I was walking to the diner when I noticed unusual footprints in the snow, as if someone was walking in circles back and forth for a long period. But there was nobody around, and all the office buildings seemed to be closed. I keep walking. All of a sudden, a man that was hiding behind the church reveals himself. He doesn't look hostile, but there's something extremely odd about him. He's wearing baggy jeans, a dirty hoodie, and a blue cap. It was extremely cold, and his outfit was not the best for this weather. He approaches me smiling. He starts walking on my side. Hey there, in English. Hey, where are you from? Don't be afraid, I like foreigners. The vast majority of the population there looks East Asian, so it's easy to tell I'm not a local. His English is surprisingly good. I keep walking in silence. 
You don't need to be afraid, my friend. I'm part of the couch surfing community. I'm a nice guy. Look. He tries to show me something on his phone. Maybe his couch surfing profile page. Would you stay here at my place? He says. Uh, no, dude. Thank you. I say. And he responds. Okay. Would you give me some money to buy us both a coffee? You don't have to come with me. What the hell is this guy on? At that moment, I was already in front of the restaurant and casually opened the door to enter. He didn't follow me. Two weeks later, same Saturday routine, lunch at the diner and then back home. On my way, I decided to grab a coffee at a nearby place. As I'm walking to the shop, I feel someone following me. It's him, again, and wearing the same clothes. We make eye contact and he starts laughing. Then, he proceeds to do an extremely creepy thing. He hides behind a bus stop that has glass panels on the sides and keeps staring at me. I mean, I could still see him. He was being a complete creep on purpose. I enter the coffee shop and tell the barista, Hey, there's a guy following me out there. The girl looks at me worried and says something to the security guard. It's common to see guards in all shops here. The guy enters the shop. That moment the door closes behind him, the barista looks at the guard, who immediately removes him from the place. They were so fast, it almost seemed as if they knew him. Thankfully, I never saw him again. This happened about three years ago but I still think about it from time to time, and it still gives me the creeps. I had just moved into a new apartment on the first floor of a building. It was late one night, and my roommate was out, when somebody knocked on the door. This was not uncommon as we were in college, and my roommate had friends that would come by to hang out at all hours of the day. I just figured it was one of his friends, so I get up and check the people. Staring right back at me through the peephole is the eyeball pressed against it. Again, this is also something that one of our friends might do just to be funny. I chuckled and opened the door, surprised to see a guy in his mid-twenties that I didn't recognize. He was strange, to say the least. He was very hyper and immediately launched into a door-to-door -door salesman type pitch. I can't remember exactly what he was even selling, but it was something about the local university, which I also attended at that time. The whole time he was talking, he kept looking past me into the apartment. He was fidgeting and even standing on his tippy toes to see inside. Still, I just thought the guy was weird and nervous and might not have been there at all. I politely declined to buy anything from him but he wouldn't take no for an answer. I finally had to be pretty stern in telling him that I wasn't interested. He finally accepted defeat, and as I was closing the door, he put his hand out and stopped the door from closing. Before I can be like, yo, what the hell, man? He smiles at me and says, I like Mario Kart on the Nintendo 64 too. Now, me and my roommate had been staying up late into the night playing Mario Kart 64 in my bedroom for the past several weeks before that, but there was nothing that he could see from the apartment entrance that had anything to do with Mario Kart. I was taken aback and trying to add things up in my head and confusingly asked, how do you know I play Mario Kart? He then got super nervous and said, Oh, 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 I just thought that, you know, anyone with a couch like that uh, would be into Mario Kart on the Nintendo 64. Because, you know, it's like a retro game, and that's a retro couch. What in the hell is that explanation? Then he was like, okay, bye, and literally scurried away. I shut the door and locked it. I start trying to put the pieces together on how he could have known that because obviously it wasn't because of my grandma's old couch. Remember, it's a first floor apartment that backed up to the woods. My roommate got home shortly after that, 
and I immediately tell him about the encounter. He was freaked out too, and so we started investigating. At first, it seemed as if there was no way to even see inside my bedroom. My blinds were always down. We went outside and tested and found that the only way to see inside would have been if you had your face right up against the window. And even then, you kind of had to crouch and close one eye just to even get a glimpse of the inside. A couple more creepy details. My window was over a balcony, and the Nintendo 64 console itself was stored inside of the TV stand and was not visible. You'd only be able to see it while we were actively playing, which we never did until we were a little stoned and it was like 2 a.m. So basically, this creep had been jumping the railing to our balcony, pressing his face against my window and watching us play Mario Kart in the middle of the night. Never saw the guy again, but needless to say, I was pretty paranoid for a while after that. I constantly checked my windows and woke up in the middle of the night paranoid that he was standing just a couple of feet away, watching me sleep. Just a very unsettling encounter. I'm glad that nothing more came of that, and I never saw him again. But I have always wondered, what his motives were. I moved into the neighborhood I live in right now about 10 years ago when I was nine. The school district in this area is really good and a new elementary school had just opened up at the time. So my parents thought it was a great place to go this is the general time frame for this encounter. Everything went fine and dandy for the most part. I attended third grade at the school, and my sister went to the middle school, not too far from it. One day, though, my sister came home with a note from the school admins. Apparently, there had been increasing reports of child predators in the area, whether these had been noted via children telling their encounters or terrified parents reporting their missing kids. I was too young to know. The notice was warning parents about it and telling them to caution their children. Naturally, hearing this, my rather protective, exceptionally Asian parent sat my sister and I down and nearly gave us the whole shebang when it came to child predators. They told us as much as they could about the awful things a predator would do to us if we ever got caught without having to use the word, our word that I can't say here on YouTube, sorry. Suffice to say, she and I got the gist of it. What I remember most clearly about the exchange is the pains they went to in making sure we could catch on to any of the tricks that a potential kidnapper might use on us. The last if you've seen a little dog, my mother said to me, the last if you help them look for it. Even though we were sufficiently spooked, I went to school the next day without thinking too much of it. After all, I didn't think it could ever happen to me. Now, because the elementary school was so entrenched in the neighborhood, it was within short biking distance. I rode there every morning and rode home every evening, and that day was the same. I remember turning the corner of the sidewalk and riding towards the T intersection, the corner of which my house occupied. As I was leisurely biking along, a truck slowly pulled into the street and drove up next to me. I want to say it was a black pickup truck, but I can't remember exactly. What I do recall is slowing down and looking over at it. As the window rolled down, a man leaned out. I think he looked young, but... As a child, I had a somewhat skewed sense of age judgment. I remember very clearly that he was Caucasian, however. He asked me, Have you seen a little dog? I was so spooked. I stared at him wide-eyed for a full moment before biking full speed diagonally across the road to get to my house as fast as I could. I remember glancing back over my shoulder to see him look around before turning into another intersection. 
What I don't remember is what I told my parents when I got home. The next day, at school, I got pulled out of class by the principal. She took me into an unoccupied classroom that wasn't being used for lack of people. She asked me all sort of things about the man. What did he look like? What kind of car was he driving? How old I thought he was, etc. I couldn't give them a very good description because I didn't know much about the make or model of a car and I was afraid that any concrete details I could give them would just be my brain trying to fill in the gaps. She thanked me and told me that a police report would be filed. I didn't hear anything of it after that, but for a long time, I was scared of being out in the neighborhood alone. Five years later, when I was in middle school, I learned that one of the kindergarten teachers at that elementary school got booked for child molestation. Two years after that, when I was in high school, it was one of the gym teachers, so the area really did have a bit of a problem. At any rate, I never learned what became of my police report. Maybe that man really was just looking for his dog. Whatever the case, sir, let's never meet again. As I was walking home from work last night, about halfway to my house, a disheveled man who looked to be either homeless or extremely down on his luck crossed paths with me from the other side of the sidewalk. He had initially began walking in the opposite direction, but as soon as he saw me, he immediately turned around and started following me. He began rambling incoherently and aggressively, and his words were so slurred that I hardly understood a thing he said. All I could make out was something about a care package and look at you. It was obvious this man was under the influence of multiple substances. I quickened my pace and tried to avoid any eye contact with this man, and he was getting agitated that I wasn't paying attention to him. When my walking speed got too quick for his inebriated stumbling to keep up with, he stopped talking and instead began just trying to follow me. I kept looking over my shoulder at him, and every time I saw him, he would either stop or try to duck behind a bush. Finally, I started out right sprinting and looking for a spot that I could hide myself in. I came up to my local mosque and tried to sneak around the corner into the parking lot of it, where there was a tree that I hid behind. While hiding there, I frantically called 911. I told them that a strange man displaying unstable behavior was trying to follow me and describe my location, myself, and the man to them. The dispatcher assured me that officers were on their way to where I was, but while waiting for them, I saw a figure heading up the sidewalk in front of the parking lot I was hiding in. Panic immediately filled me until the passerby was close enough to where I could see that it was not the same man who had just bothered me, and they turned out to be harmless. Mere moments after this, the cops arrived to where I was, pulled up to the tree, and motioned for me to come out and talk to them. The officer driving the vehicle asked me the standard questions, a description of the incident, where I was when it happened, etc. While he was talking, he spotted a man in another parking lot down the street, not far from where I had first encountered the creek. He asked if it was that man I had encountered, and it was hard to tell between the darkness and the distance, but I was pretty sure it was. Another police vehicle had pulled into that lot, and it appeared that an officer got out to talk to the man. The officer I had been talking to asked me how far I was from my house, and I told him I was pretty close to my street at this point. He assured me, that I should be safe to walk the rest of the way home, and that they had other cop cars patrolling the area. I thanked him and finished walking home without further incident, thank God. Shortly after I got home, I saw that I had a text from my boyfriend that read, Are you okay? The text had been sent at around the same time the incident was occurring, as if he could sense I was in 
a fearful situation. I replied back, telling him what had happened. He told me that he had gotten yelled at by a homeless man earlier, too. I described the creep I encountered to him and asked him if he thought it was the same guy. He said he didn't think so. We also had a brief phone call to make sure each other was okay. I let him know that I was home safe, and he told me he was in a vehicle with a group, so he was safe too. I don't know what the cops ended up doing about the man, but I hope he stays as far away from me as possible. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true creepy encounters. Before I go any further, I would like to recognize and give a very special thank you to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Innerscare, Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Ada Smith, Colt Stonewolf, Les Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's Niece, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank each of you for your continued support. For without you, there wouldn't be a me or a Back to Ashes channel. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night. Peace, love, and light to you all.